Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is uh, January 17th, 2018, and we are very, very excited uh, for today's episode. We have with us returning um, to Mormon Stories Podcast. First, uh, we'll welcome back Jamie Hannes Handy. Hey, Jamie, uh, where are you joining us from? South Lake, Texas. Thanks for joining us. We're excited to have you here. Thanks. Uh, we also have joining us back on Mormon Stories Podcast, uh, the wonderful Lindsay Hanson Park, uh, head of Sunstone and your Polygamy Podcast. Lindsay, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, have you seen Greatest Showman yet? No, I haven't even seen Star Wars yet. What is, you, we got to work on that. No. Well, welcome. Thanks for joining us. We also have returning to Mormon Stories, uh, Glenn Oslin, some of you who are hardcore uh, fans of Mormon Stories podcast will remember that the great Glenn Oslin, uh, once upon a time, on an episode about divorce, but he is also now super famous and known as the as Glenn on Infants on Thrones. Glenn, welcome to welcome back to Mormon Stories podcast. Thanks, John. And then finally, uh, joining us again. Uh, Back on Mormon Stories for uh, her who knows how many appearances, we have Dr. Oh. Gina Colvin. Uh, Gina is the host of a Thoughtful Faith podcast, and she's awesome. Gina, welcome back. Thank you, John. It's good to be back. All right. So um, this is this is going to be this is a this is the type of podcast that's kind of hard to dive into. So I'm going to give a little bit of history about this episode. Today's episode um, is about this concept called spiral dynamics, and um, I, I learned about spiral dynamics from uh, a friend, a new friend of mine, who learned about it on a podcast called The Liturgists Podcast. Um, and the liturgists, when they introduced this, uh, this concept of spiral dynamics, they spent like 10 or 15 minutes setting it up. And they wondered themselves once they did whether it would have made more sense just to dive into it. But having said all that, Gina, since you sort of study these frameworks as uh, and research them as a, and teach them as part of what you do. Do you mind uh, just giving us a tiny bit of a setup for what what we're doing here when we talk about these sorts of things and why it might be interesting or important? I think uh, spiral dynamics occurs in the family of theories about uh, development, adult development. Uh, spiral dynamics in particular deals with the growth of consciousness in any given society. Uh, now, I'm interested in it because I'm interested in faith development theory, which is called FDT in ministry, uh, which is the suggestion that adults aren't static, that we grow into other forms of consciousness. And spiral dynamics takes sort of a more agnostic approach. It's about the track states of consciousness in any given society at any, at, in any given time and suggests that it's spiral because we're always circling back. We're sort of moving, growing into, growing away from these forms of consciousness. But on the whole, spiral dynamics suggest that there is sort of a, there's a, there's a point at which societies get to uh, that can, that, that feels like the collective sort of dynamic that that creates this fabric of feeling. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And if I had to just add my sort of blue collar cheeseburger sort of uh, <laughs> justification for this, it would be that we're in this really interesting Mormon moment. We've just had President Thomas S. Monson die. Um, we, we now have uh, Russell and Nelson ascending as prophet. We've been doing... John, when, when you say we, we had President Monson die, you didn't have anything to do with that, right? Well, no, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> that's, that's not a, a bad thank question. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for clarifying, Glenn. All right. Um, but, uh, um, you know, a lot of us have been sort of trying to contribute in our various ways in the Mormon, progressive Mormon, post-Mormon, uh, Mormon scholarship sort of communities for now well over a decade. Um, Lindsay, when did I first meet you? You were blogging for FMH when we first met, right? 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, so we've been at this for a long time, and, and I think it's worthwhile to be reflective of where, where we are, where the church is, where humanity is, 
this is this applies to politics, not just religion, not just faith development. This applies to all sorts of different arenas, but specifically today, I want to lay out for our listeners, I want us to lay out for our listeners this sort of framework and then allow it to have us be a bit self-reflective, not only about where we are and where we want to go. And, and I'll just say, here's why I picked the people that I picked. Uh, Glenn is here because Glenn is super excited about this model. He's been thinking about the future of Infants on Thrones and where he wants to take it next and what he wants to do. Um, and so I think Glenn's just always insightful and thoughtful and witty and fun. That's why I've got Glenn on. Lindsay, you know, with her initiative on at Sunstone, Lindsay, tell us what the theme was of Sunstone last, uh, last summer. So our overall theme is there's more than one way to Mormon. So we're trying to meet people where they're at in different schools of thought and different lifestyles and even, you know, extremes around the Mormon spectrum and get everyone in the same room and learn how to coexist and to share ideas. Yeah. And so in some ways, Lindsay, you've been sort of riding the spiral dynamics train, even if you haven't been aware of what it is yet. And maybe some of us are following some of your leadership in this regard. So that's why I wanted you on. We already, I've already mentioned Gina. Now, Gina, you're changing the focus of a thoughtful faith. Do you want to just talk about that just a tiny bit? Oh, I think, uh, and particularly in the field of human development and adult faith development, uh, it, it tracks along really nicely with my work in ministry uh, because it asks the question, how do we deal with people who are changing, whose consciousnesses are changing. That's a real pastoral, really important pastoral question. And James Fowler called, how do we cultivate environments of developmental expectation? Um, which is to say, how do we hold people uh, and honor their changing faith lives? Because it kind of, because if you, if you are out of sync with the way in which that particular church community or what faith community is calibrating at you consider deviant which i think has happened to a lot of mormons that uh, they've been led to understand that their intuitive development the growth of their consciousness is something that is deviant um, and that has huge spiritual effects i think absolutely okay can i can i add, please go ahead uh, jump uh, in yeah Gina, you, you've said consciousness six times now and i love it <gasps> you're and, counting yeah because because it, it's one of the things that, you know, John was saying, I'm interested in taking infants in a new direction. You know, I've just been learning all this stuff uh, and consciousness is a big part of that. What do you mean when you say consciousness? Could you give us a definition of that? I suppose it's how we, I mean, we could talk at a soul level or an intellectual level, but there is sort of the way that we integrate new ways of experiencing um, the world and others. And you know, I mean, we, we can talk about spiral dynamics. There's a particular consciousness which allows for us to feel justified in locking down and protecting community. But what happens when, you know, there's usually a disruption or some kind of eruption that complicates that, that moves us into another way of seeing the world. So I suppose I'm using it interchangeably with the idea of um, worldview. Or, or like an awareness or just yeah. like ha how, how you see things, what you're aware of, the meaning, the purpose of everything. That's all kind of lumped into consciousness. Uh, I suppose that's the way I'm using it. I'm not sure if I'm using it correctly. But I mean, if you look at the idea of awakening um, is also mm -hmm. a way of kind of consciousness development. And I'm not yeah. suggesting it's going anywhere, but just I suppose there are many traditions. I have it in my Maori tradition that there is a way in which we begin to see different things. Yeah. Um, and, and, and accommodate our lives and our thinking and the way we in, uh, are with the world. Cool. John, can I jump in? Please, Lindsay, jump in. Um, just so to give some background, I think, on what we're talking about and what Gina is referring to, the spiral dynamics, I just wanted to give a little bit of background that I found helpful. So um, what is that personality test that everyone takes when you get the color? I forget the name. Meyer Briggs. Myers-Briggs, yeah, and I, maybe it's because I'm a hipster without the good fashion sense, but I, like that always bugged me. I'm like, I don't want to tell you my color because it doesn't feel quite right. I think I'm like a yellow-blue or something. I can't remember, but there was this big trend in psychology in the 50s and 60s to sort of come up with ways to understand human behavior and, and uh, worldview points and things like that, and 
person who originally started pioneering this spiral dynamics was Claire Graves, who was a contemporary to Abraham Maslow, who did the, you know, the hierarchy, hierarchy of needs that we all know about. And they talked about this a lot. And it is said that Abraham Maslow said that Graves' model spiral dynamics was far superior to his, but he never lived to publish his research. He died before he could do that. But what I like about this approach, unlike the Meyer Briggs stuff, which is fine, it's fine, but it doesn't label people as you're this, and this is the confines of uh, how you're going to stay, and you're inherently assigned to these traits. Spiral dynamics is a way, is, is sort of the same approach, like Myers-Briggs and all these things, but it says it's really complicated, and it's really messy, and people move from here, and they move from here, from this space to this space. And that's what I like about it, because that's what I found in my own life. Yeah, absolutely. And Jamie, we have you on, not, not only because you're brilliant, but because in some ways, I think you're trying to live this out, because you, you are every bit of a progressive Mormon as any of us, and yet you're still active and, you know, engaging in the church, right? And so I'm sure these themes connected with you. Is that true? It is. You know, what I liked about it is I think um, it's the growth mindset idea that we didn't come with a fixed ability. We didn't come with a fixed um, status that as we learn and grow and develop, um, that you can look at this this framework both at an individual context and then as part of a larger community. Um, and recognize that one position is not necessarily morally superior than another position. Um, and it provides that empathy and grace that you can have for someone that may not be seeing the world the same as you. And you can step back and say, do you know, my experiences uh, and my culture and my um, life uh, have, have led me to a different state right now. And I can understand the, the position that you're in. And I can respect that position and not feel like your position makes you stupid. Yeah. which I think is human nature that we want to label each other and we want to consider where we are always to be the, the better or the preferred path. Um, you know, that's one thing that I have found is really difficult as you take the time to be thoughtful and reflective and on how to uh, pattern and, and, and make conscious decisions in your life about what you're going to do, that everyone is pulling for you to choose their path. Um, they want that verification by, by if you do what they're doing, then they feel justified and feel better about their decision. You know, it's, it's a recruitment. The more people that decide to behave how you behave, the more, the better they feel. So everybody who went to a certain college wants everybody around them to choose that college. You feel better about your choice. Um, and this sort of, it just provides that framework. I think it's far greater than the hierarchy of needs, which I've always liked, but because it allows for movement forwards and backwards, um, it's not static, it's constantly changing. Um, and, and the biggest thing is that when you can say, okay, I'm kind of feeling like I'm right here, you can see steps that you can take to move to the next level, or you can see steps to help your community, or you can see things. It's, it's a really positive mindset uh, for, for us to interpret, you know, our Mormon cultural experiences uh, with regular world experiences. Love it. And, I think, uh, I think go, the, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, the, 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 other, the other thing about that, Jamie, when you move from one to another, you yeah, don't lose where you were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, that, that's always still yeah. a part of it. I, I, I think may, maybe later on we'll get into this a little bit more, but I, I think the, the non-judgmental part of saying this isn't any better than that, I, I want to challenge that a little bit, but maybe we can do that later. <laughs> let's do it. So let's dive in. So um, I'll get, this is all great. I'll, I'll, now, now that I said we want to avoid doing a meta conversation about the conversation. We just spent about 15 minutes doing that. Uh, let's dive in. So uh, I'm going to give a really crude uh, and basic attempt at explaining spiral dynamics. And it begins, for, first of all, rudeness on Mormon stories. I can't I wait. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> and we've already kind of goofed up because we've, we've mentioned levels. And, and it, spiral dynamics is explicitly set up, unlike Fowler's stages of faith that has numbers, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five, for example. Uh, spiral dynamics avoids using numbers, um, but instead it uses colors. And then um, each color uh, represents what spiral dynamics calls a V-meme. Now, don't let that annoy you or freak you out. Basically, a V-meme uh, is technically referred to as a values container, but just think of it as a model or a way 
you know, a, a, a different way that people understand uh, the world. It's a container for memes. It's a worldview. And it's sort of a worldview that in some ways can limit the boundaries of your cognition. That's the way that uh, V memes were defined. And we're going to just jump right into it. But when we, when we talk about V memes, just think of it as a worldview. And, and basically, there are six or seven different colors that are represented um, within Spiral Dynamics. And we're going to talk about each one briefly. Uh, and so here we go. Uh, and, and by the way, we will put a link to a graphic or a visual that uh, will help you guys see and understand these different um, these different uh, V memes. And you can, uh, uh, all of you who are panelists right now, if you want to go to the um, Liturgist uh, podcast on Spiral Dynamics and pull up the images that they have there, that can sort of be a framework from which we try to talk about this stuff. So let's dive into it. The first color uh, that Spiral Dynamics talks about is beige. And when you think about beige as a worldview or as a V-meme, think of it as, as we've already talked about, very much on the lower levels of, of, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's a worldview around survival. Think of it as you being sort of infantile in, or primitive in your worldview. It's where you live your life almost in an animalistic way, where you respond to stimulus. I think Mormonism might refer to this as the natural man. It's basically uh, responding and, and, and making choices in your life based on stimulus or not making choices, but instead just reacting. Uh, a way that the litur liturgist talked about this was, if someone points a gun to you, you go beige, which is your lizard brain. It's your, um, it's your amygdala. It's your reptilian brain. And it's sort of living on the edge of survival. So... Um, you know, probably we don't know many people who live in beige, maybe a homeless person. That's the first thing that came to my mind, somebody who's just living to survive. But that's beige. And one thing we're going to find out is these, these V-memes rotate between individualistic and sort of group-based or communal. Um, but do any of you have something you want to say about beige, or is it just sort of like Fowler stage one where everybody just ignores it and moves on? Oh, I have a question. Yes. Um, do you think we have sex in beige? Yeah, we have lots of sex in beige. Right, yeah. Lots of unre un unmoderated, unregulated sex. Hey, yes. hey, explain what you mean by that, Gina. <laughs> well, what I mean is that if this is sort of like beige is a state of nature, it's quite, it's quite um, embodied. Um, you know, and there's not a rational brain that really goes on with sex. You know, I mean, maybe there is for some people, but it's just not for me, you know, TMI. Um, <laughs> It so I'm just help. thinking. Let, let's say that it just—it doesn't help. <laughs> no, it doesn't. I go beige. It's like you know, yeah. just give it to me, baby. You know, I, there's there's no rationality there. But I I think we're still doing what what John was worried. Like we're acting like this is some low base. And my understanding of this dynamic is this is just a, a phase or a, gosh, like our human, you know, constructions aren't sufficient enough to sort of articulate what they're trying to communicate with this model. But it's not like it's a lower level. And so, Gina, to answer your question, I don't you think sex could fit into a lot of these things depending depending where you're at in your development? I think what the beige would cover is your physical response, your physical desire, uh, the hormones, um, hmm. just the like you say the natural tendencies, which are a part of sex, but don't have to be all of sex. Well, this is true. Yes, I'm just talking about my sex, which is like a definitely beige. <laughs> A bit of red but too. I, I think, again, I think when, if we're trying to always say, oh, that this is lower, I think, I think I have beige moments every day, all day um, with my kids, with my spouse, with myself, you know, I mean, before I, on the podcast, I set out dinner and food, or we were going to have a beige revolution occurring at my house. Like, um, you know, these, these needs and this basic forget over um, that we're humans and we need to eat and we're humans and we experience and we're humans and we experience line uh, don't go away I mean every day I spend my time meeting the beige needs of my family mm. and myself absolutely yeah we can't escape our our amygdala we can't escape our reptilian brain it's there for a reason and it's sort of 
it's, it's sort of where we begin. Past. It's where, where we begin. What's that? Did someone say something? I don't know, but I've got some things to say. Um, I, I, I think if, if we're saying that, that beige are those basic needs, um, and, and we also talked about consciousness or awareness, that, that beige would be like the first things that we're aware of in the world that we need. I, and, and, and so, you know, framing it as, as awareness, that that awareness doesn't go away as our awareness expands into other places, that's still at the core. So that's still why in sex or in food or, you know, these basic needs, we still can, can be in this beige space. I, I, I was trying to think of a, of a church analogy as I was listening to these things, and I thought, Maybe um, as a as a child, uh, one year old, two year old, attending nursery. When you were in nursery, maybe nursery is a more yeah like Cheerios. Beige. Cheerio, it's Cheerios. <laughs> that that you're just there. It's like the kids are kind of doing their own thing. They're just buying time, and the parents they just want to get the kids out of their hair so that they can go yeah. on with the church meetings. And you know, so that's that's like a beige space in the in the church in the Elias Chapel. It's cups, it's cups of juice and Cheerios and, mm. you know, playing with toys. <laughs> but is, is that too loud? That's better. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think the problem that I have, though, with the way that we're still talking about this is um, we're talking about it in, like Cheerios and grape juice as if it's a negative thing. That's right. It's not and negative. I, I think that's you, Lindsay. I'm, I'm just projecting. I think you're placing well, I like Cheerios just Cheerios fine. And, yeah. <laughs> no, I think, so I, I'm reminded now that Gina's got me thinking about sex. Thank you, Gina. Uh, Lisa Butterworth, who started Feminist Mormon Housewives, she, she gives out sex advice from time to time. And one of the best advice that I've ever heard her give about sex is if you're having problems with sex, just turn your animal brain on. Just turn your animal brain on. Just go for it. And to me, that's what I think about. And it honestly, it's almost the closest thing to mindfulness that I can experience this idea of like, just let your animal brain take over, be in the moment, think about it for a minute. So I don't see it as like a underdeveloped nope. uh, way to it's, be. It's a part of all of us. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Okay. So we've talked about beige. Now let's go to uh, the next V meme, uh, which is purple. And um, when you think about, now remember, these alternate between an individualistic and sort of a communal worldview. So purple, think about now this next stage in human consciousness, where instead of sort of being a lone caveman walking on the prairie, you are now grouping together with other uh, people into tribes. Um, and so purple represents our tribal identity. We hunt. We, um, you know, we, we seek, to, we, we, we grow crops. We look at the world and natural disasters and wars and famine around us, and we try and make sense of it. Um, and we, we know that there are these unseen forces out there that have influences in our lives, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, the seasons, etc. And we want to make sense of it. And uh, the, the liturgist said that the person with the most power in the purple uh, sort of V meme is the shaman. And the shaman is the one who, who can uh, look at the forces, the unseen forces in the universe, and can uh, make sense of them and tell the tribe what's going on. Why is there a flood? Why is there a famine? Uh, what, you know, what, what's coming around the corner? Um, and so again, purple is very tribal. You can also think of purple as like college football. So, you know, just why are you a Notre Dame fan or a Florida state fan or Gina, give us a New Zealand, uh, uh, rugby team. Um, oh, crusaders. Crusaders. Like, why are you a crusader? Because you're a crusader, right? It's your tribe. Right. And it's still very primal. Um, but it's just all about identity and tribalism. So it's sort of the next step beyond beige. Now that's purple. And now I want to invite anyone to jump in if they want to add anything about purple. Glenn, why don't you start? Oh, Jamie. Jamie, you, you go then, Glenn. I'd like to start by calling on Jamie. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I think we could summarize this in our um, religious context as the God of the gaps. 
And, you know, the shaman or the person that was seeing it almost is the person with the greatest imagination who could explain the unexplainable. You know, when you're not sure what is to fill that space or to um, explain to the group, you know, you're, you're a storyteller, you're crafting a narrative. This is where myth originates. And so this idea that myth and humanity um, have a very long history going back on how we explain things. Love it. Glenn, should we talk about myth? No, <laughs> done enough of that lately. I, I, I think um, one of the things that I liked about that liturgist podcast, the way that they explain in spiral dynamics, and, and Gina referenced it earlier when she was talking about it, is that each, each one of these colors is a response to the previous one. So it, it's like in, in, in beige, there are pros, there are cons. And you know, you're, you're, when you're all about the pros, it's great. When you start becoming aware of the cons, then you've got to adapt. And so the adaptation of that puts you from the beige to what they're calling purple. And so if we look at it that way, and we say there's this individualistic, communal, uh, like tug of war, push and pull going uh, between it. W once the individual realizes I'm getting my individual needs met, but I I don't have that social connection and I need that social connection that that's when you get into the, the purple and there's all kinds of benefits that go with that. But then you start becoming aware of the cons and it moves. You. And so it's like, that's kind of a framework that moves you through all of these things. And again, it doesn't erase where you were before. It just adds to what it adds to or so. Very good. Yeah, I, I think um, having recently read the book Sapiens and then Homo Deus, um, you know, th this idea of mythology as, uh, and, and just fictions that is able to come be from language as we're communicating with each other and we have some kind of a, a story or shared values that are able to bind us together as a group or a tribe. It's a really powerful instinct. And, and if spiral dynamics is right, it's, it's the initial, it's the first time uh, humans are really uh, experiencing the power of being in a group. And, and, and that reminds me, there's, it seems also like with Spiral Dynamics, there's two different conversations going on in that liturgist podcast. There's the one about how humanity developed over history, but then there's also like your personal <laughs> journey through, through the colors as well. And there's kind of a parallel between the two of them. So that, that might get mixed up as we're talking about it. Um, but that, that's where I see purple is very powerful. It binds people together in kind of the same, I don't want to say primitive because that seems like it's pejorative, but it, these very initial uh, important ways to who we are. Yeah, we are a lone animal is a dead animal, as they say. Yeah. We are tribal. We are, we are evolutionarily evolved if you buy into evolution to be tribal creatures. And so this, this not only goes back tens of thousands of years, if not more, it's also still very much with us. Lindsay, what do you, what do you want to say about purple? Um, I just, I feel like this has a lot to do with my Mormonism. I mean, this sort of magical thinking and myths and blood oaths and all of, of that stuff really is in this area. And for me growing up, my faith was really superstitious actually, you know, and, and that comes along with prosperity gospel. If you are righteous, then you'll be blessed. And so that is how you choose to look at the world that if you do a b and c then d will happen and you get superstitious about it and so i think that a lot of mormons can understand and um really identify with this color at least at least i did because there's a lot of magical thinking involved love it all right gina what do you want to add oh i think uh purple is uh sort of the color of the um old testament sort of a, a sacred text of the yeah. purple yeah. Um, and in many ways, if you're talking spiral dynamics, many of us are in blue reading the purple text or even orange yes, or even yes. green. So, and we'll, um, they, don't, they don't know what we mean by blue, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just to kind of own that and classically, that's, that's the Old Testament is, a, is a, a sacred text of the purple. Yeah. Meaning that it's, I mean, what I think what many people view the Old Testament now is a bunch of tribal justifications for things that happened that were attributed to God, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you've got the shaman there who's taking care of the narratives. You've got tribal politics and people trying to explain things using mythology and story and narratives. Uh, I think, you know, that's what it is. Yeah. And I'll give you one really quick. Please. Can I give you one? Yeah. 
Um, and sorry, I just took off my mic because it's giving me problems. But uh, this is one that I grew up thinking that if you break the Sabbath on Sunday or if like someone gets in a car accident on Sunday, it's because they weren't in church. It's that kind of rationale. Does that fit? Do you think that fits? Yeah, sure. My sister, my, someone very close to me once said, I'm not going to stop paying tithing because I'm worried what will happen if I don't. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's like sacrifice the virgin to the Aztec sun god, right? Yeah. Uh, and lots of other things too. Uh, it's war. It's a certain type of war. It's a certain type of tribal clash. Uh, and it's, a, it's, it's also a social structure. But that's, a, that's purple. But I think it's important. Ahead, but I Jenny. think it's important to recognize that, you know, this purple need to belong is so powerful and it is almost used and abused by many groups to keep people from moving beyond, you know, and so as Glenn was saying, you know, there's pros and cons to each level. I think one of the big cons to this level is that you're forced to put tribe above individual, you know, you're forced to make uh, decisions that might go against your moral judgment. I think we can say, you know, pretty clearly the Old Testament shows many examples where somebody puts tribal um, benefit and loyalty above moral um, um, individual decision making. Um, and we still try and justify that um, when I think the appropriate answer is there is no place for that in a, in a, a as you move up this spiral dynamics. Um, and I think it's a big point. Uh, that's a good, that's a point. really good point J it, because you have to surrender part of your own power, your individualism for, for the, for the group in purple. And, you know, so, so to, to go to my, uh, church analogy, if, if beige is nursery, then purple is primary when you start being put into these classes and, and you have to like interact with the entire primary, but then also your class. And for me personally, I had so many clashes with primary teachers who were trying to keep me in line and I, I didn't want to stay, I didn't want to surrender that individualism or that power um, just to be part of this group. It was something even, <laughs> even when I was in primary, I had a hard time with. Um, so that, that's kind of in, in my made up analogy of the church, I, I see primary as being the, the purple place. So the primary colors are one, two, three, purple, purple, and purple, that's it. <laughs> now, Lindsay, this is the part where you tell Glenn that him comparing purple to primary is uh, is insulting to purple. I was thinking it, but I didn't want to say. I mean, really? I, I understand. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I'm kidding. We're trying <laughs> to put words to this idea, but I, when I hear you say that, Glenn, it feels like you're placing a judgment on like <laughs> one superior than the other. That's all. Like we're graduating, you know, and we are. I, I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't thinking that. But I, but I was thinking as as you're like as your awareness is is ex expanding. I was kidding. Yeah. But, but okay. yeah, you started something, John. Way to go. Way to go. <laughs> okay, the next V meme is red. Red is again moving back to the individualistic. So purple was sort of communal, community based. Now we're going back to red. And red's the one I have the least amount on. Think of red as being a state of ego where strength is of, of primacy. Um think about dictators. Uh think about uh, people who are all about, uh, I would almost say, uh, historically masculine or patriarchal sort of forms of, of power. Think, think Mussolini. Um, uh, Brigham and Young. Brigham Young, absolutely. It's just, it's, uh, it's, it's macho, uh, male, uh, dictatorial sort of ego. And, um, and and literature is really careful to say that it's it's not bad to have ego, you know. Ego for me as a psychologist is just kind of self awareness, and an ability to contemplate your place in the world relative to things around you. And and of course, there's still this element of the fittest survive and the the sort of alpha male ascends to the top. But it's a real primacy on ego and strength. Um, so I, th that doesn't feel like I gave red justice, but Amy, you're waving, well, you're waving at me. Um, I feel like as the current parent to three teenagers, that this is, this is teenagerhood, you know, as a, as you know, zero to 10 year olds, they, uh, welcomely participate in, 
um, the family dynamic. They are willing to come to family dinner. Um, I'm in the fourth family fun stage of parenting um, where they are reasserting their individual needs um, that we as a, as a family aren't necessarily meeting those for them and they're learning to branch out. Um, as far as them, they're learning to establish boundaries and, and, and maintain new relationships and they're forming additional tribes. And as they do that, their need to be an individual, you know, starts to soar. It's that, you know, every teenager is the most selfish person you've ever met. And, and recognizing that I was that selfish teenager, um, we all have been through that phase as you reassert yourself into the tribe and say, hey, actually, I don't want to have this for dinner tonight, or I want to have a later curfew, or I want to do this. And, and it is about um, becoming an individual and becoming your own. And it's really, uh, you know, as far as growth and development, this is a really important stage. I think a lot of people <clears throat> in the church never learn to assert themselves as individuals. They are, they feel the pressure from the tribe so significantly that that ability to speak up and have an individual voice and say, you know, this is not right. This is not something I want to do on just the previous podcast I was on, you know, we've talked about is helping our kids establish, you know, do you have any interest in even meeting with the bishop? You know, if this is not a rite of passage we're going to enforce on you as part of the tribe. This is something that, you know, if you feel like this is something you want or something you're going going for or something you would like to establish this sort of relationship, a pastoral relationship, um, is that something you want to do? And you have every right and we respect it if you say, no, this isn't what you want to do. And I think this is where um, participation in any church, not just ours, but in any church, be, uh, uh, it sets apart from others and it allows people to suddenly start looking at you from the outside. Like, why are you not just conforming? Um, right. And so I feel like, you know, a lot of people look at me and probably think I'm just in this teenager stage of um, faith development, right? Because I'm continually asserting my own individual rights um, and establishing that I, I can do that. I have that power within me and I can establish boundaries. Um, and I spend a lot of time doing it. Love it. Gina, talk to us about uh, red. I'm observing some red activity going on in my house at the moment <laughs> with two 11 year old and two 13 year old boys. And it's bringing the red out in me. So I'm just sort of watching if somebody clutches an arm and the other one clutches a hockey stick. Um, yeah. So it's pretty much a big pissing competition, really. Uh, you know, I think, I think I agree with Jamie. It's about, uh, about, you know, about the exercise of ego and learning the boundaries of that. So there's some good things, but there may not be some good things about, if I jump up, that's because there's red stuff going on. Yeah, and sometimes we, we tend to think of ego as a bad thing, like, oh, he's got so much of an ego. But that's not what we mean when we say the word ego. It's just sort of a self-concept individuated from the tribe. But it also doesn't mean not being a part of a tribe. It's basically existing in a tribe, but then developing your own sense of self independent of and then still in the context of the tribe does that make sense so don't think ego bad and there was a really good quote in the liturgist podcast that said you have to have an ego to then transcend your ego so it requires first that you develop it Lindsay, talk to us about red because okay, you, so, you have red hair of all the people that should be talking to us about red it's you it's not real um okay so it's real I, it's true it's true it's more real it's true thank you john uh, so I've been reading Joseph Campbell a lot lately, so I've got like the hero's journey on, on the brain, but I, when I think about this in this framework, I think about an individual who comes as an animal, as a human comes as an animal, and then we start looking around and we say, well, why are things the way that they are? And in the sort of purple world, it would be like, you know, the tribe around you tells you these magical stories of this is why things are the way they are. This is how the world works. But your questions might not be satisfied or you need a deeper understanding and so red to me is a response to like the order and the sort of structure that purple creates but it doesn't quite fit and so sometimes when that happens at least with me I, I experience it in the church when the stories and the examples will take polygamy for example they were bothering me and their usual answers weren't sufficient anymore I didn't have the tools or the skill set or the understanding to come to the complexity of the practice that I do now after years and years of research. What I did have was a lot of anger. <laughs> I had a lot of angst. And so how I expressed this disconnect that I was feeling that these answers were not sufficient was 
rage, was protests, was tantrums, was things like that. And so for me, red is sort of that way to exert your individuality like Jamie was talking about, but probably in a way that isn't helpful in community. So it's the law of the jungle, like they always say, and it's survival of the fittest. So that's how I contextualize red. I love it. Now, now, Glenn, before we bring you on, I want to check in with our commenters because we've got a few fun comments. Alan writes, sure, appreciate you, Lindsay. So, Lindsay, Alan wants to give a shout out to you. So, uh, say Thanks, hi to Alan. Alan. Um, Daniel, who's uh, someone who I've gotten to know recently, he says red equals cult of personality. He says, I think a charismatic leader would fit the bill, not just raw testosterone. That's a great contribution from Daniel. And then Kendra writes, all my favorite people uh, live love it. And then Glenn, the reason I cut you off is because Kendra also writes, it's weird to see Glenn live. I've been listening to him on his podcast for a while now. I never had a face to put to his voice. Ha ha funny, not his face, just the thought. So you can respond to Kendra and to red if you want now, Glenn. Oh, you muted yourself. Try again, Glenn. Unmute yourself then talk. Oh, there. okay. So I thought I was on mute because there's a siren coming behind me and I was trying to no problem yeah, no problem hi Kendra so, I, I said hi Kendra okay um, so I, if, if you know I've been developing this nursery to primary thing thinking about my own life my own experience right. after primary I went into young men's and that meant for me going into the scouting program and one of the most horrifying things I ever had to experience was my first scout outing when the older scouts were saying, okay, now it's time to initiate the younger scouts. Yeah. Me, this is a very red activity of, of recognizing we've all been in a group. There's benefits to the group in purple, but there's some disadvantages. You have to surrender your power. Damn it. Oh, can I say damn it? I'm Mormon stars. I yes. want my, I want my uh, power back. And so red is like, I'm going to assert myself. So, so we had these older scouts that kind of terrorized the younger scouts. And, and um, can I give an example of what they said they were going to do? Yeah, please. Now, they didn't do this. I was really glad, but it scared us. They said, we're going we're gonna, to uh, take you to a, a, a campfire. We're going to take a hot dog. We're going to cook it over the, the campfire. You're going to have to pull down your pants. We're going to stick the hot dog between your butt cheeks, you're going to have to run from the fire to oh the tree and back to the fire. And if the hot dog falls out, you have to eat it. <laughs> I was 12 years old. That's oh, real? I still remember that. That scared me. <laughs> but that's very red, I think, from Spiral Dynamics, a, an example of the, the redness as awareness is expanding. And you're saying, no, I've got I've to get my power where I can. Here are some uh, weak newbies that I can take advantage of. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I have to say about red. All right, Glenn, I think I have a sense that you're using us for therapy. Oh, I've been, I've been podcasting for therapy for nine <laughs> years now. I think I've been using all of you I love for therapy. <laughs> uh, Jen uh, Jennifer asks, what are we talking about? Jennifer joined us late. Jennifer, we're talking about spiral dynamics. Daniel was kind enough to share uh, a visual with you all in the Facebook live feed but it's these different sort of uh, phases of development of human consciousness. And so far, uh, we have talked about a few. We've talked about beige, purple, and red. Um, and everybody's given great contributions. Michelle writes, ego and arrogance are not the same thing. And that's, uh, that's a very succinct and thoughtful way to put it, Michelle. All right, so we've talked about red. Now it is time to move on to where the rubber's really gonna start meeting uh, the road. Uh, and that is, we're going to talk about blue. Um, blue represents, you could say religion. Um, there's a sacred text in blue that is supposed to be the source of all truth. Uh, in blue, in the worldview of blue, because again, we're moving from an individualistic to a more communal uh, paradigm in the religious world, in the blue world, there's a single cause. Um, there's a single reason to live. There's a, there's a single God, um, and there are new rules, and these rules that God gives when he sends Moses down with the Ten Commandments, although that is Old Testament, but when he sends Christ to give the new law, the, the laws are put down, and these laws uh, provide order. They provide stability. They keep Boy Scouts from forcing Glenn to run around with a hot dog between his butt cheeks, basically. 
Um, it, it protects the weak, uh, not to say Glenn is weak. Um, and it, it provides, uh, it, it, it helps people, motivates people to strive towards developing their character. And one of its strengths is it helps to nurture when it's acting in its best moral character and fiber of its uh, participants. It's very collectivist. Um, and in many instances, it, it, I think the liturgist podcast said it sort of jives well with capitalism and democracy. So it basically represents sort of 1980s uh, America, which the, the religious right and religion and uh, democracy, uh, et cetera. Now, why don't we start this time with Lindsay? What would you like to add as we discuss uh, Blue? Well, you are talking about it in the framework of religion, which I think is fair, but I also think that this is just human nature in society, because what we're talking about is it needs to keep people safe. We need these black and white rules. We need law and justice, good and evil. And, you know, feminist theory, we're always talking about this sort of uh, angel and whore dynamic that women are placed under because it's humans want to make it easy. We want to make it black or white. We want to make people villains or heroes. And so that certainly shows up in religion. But I also think that that is just, the, I think it's the cancer society. I mean, like you said, it, it's meant to keep people safe because it's an easy way to do it in a collectivist, you know, society. But it it uh, is very incomplete. See, Lindsay, when you say cancer of society, I get the feeling that you're kind of being pejorative about it. <laughs> no, I don't know about you, but when I went to church, we had that at snack time. Okay. Cancer? Cancer at snack time, yeah. yeah. And grape juice. Great. Yeah. There's always got to be a running gag. You can't have a podcast without a running gag. <laughs> I love it. Gina, what, what do you want to share about blue? Hey, do you like blue? How, what are your feelings about blue, Gina? Well, you know, um, I have an interesting relationship with blue because what you're talking about is white, currently blue being controlled by white patriarchal colonialists, Western colonialism. Um, and, and, and blue is always going to be that domain of control, institutional and social control. Um, whoever controls it, whether or not you're a fascist or a communist, um, you know, it, it's, it's reasonably arbitrary. Uh, but you know, I agree that it's a it's a, a domain of stability, but it, but but because it is, it doesn't have very many movable parts to it. It's always going to trip over itself and produce people who are who are, are going to retreat to the edges to to move more flexibility into that system. I think very much the LDS Church is a blue church. Very um, much. Yep. I think we have um, an exilic culture which is going out to the margins of the blue church and speaking. And I think that's a prophetic culture. In many respects, when you look at the prophetic tradition, what has happened, and we can talk about Walter Brueggemann and this understanding of, and his understanding of a royal consciousness, which is empire, which is the order of the day, which rests it, it which, which promises a kind of um, uh, fallacious or pretense of stability that people are really deeply attracted to. Um, and the role of the prophetic is to speak into the, the core and the source of that power uh, and to upset it and create an eruption. Uh, so, oh. yeah, blue is always with us. And I would say that uh, the, maybe the focus for A Thoughtful Faith last year, 2017, was maybe to talk about the challenges of the blueness of Mormonism. Is that fair to say? Yes, yes. And where, where it falls short, right? Yeah, because it's easy, to, it's easy to do that. It's easy to feel red. And I think a lot of my podcasts, or some of my podcasts, have been in the kind of like red thing, like bugger them, bastard sort of stuff, um, in response to this blueness. Uh, yeah. Because so, the, blue, you know, the blueness has some disadvantages. It, it's not great at at always uh, moving to the needs, responding to the needs of people on the margins, right? Well, well blue is self-serving. Yeah. Uh, and I think if you want to put it in a religious context, blue genuinely um, idolizes itself uh, and idolizes those and rewards those who reproduce the system. Right. Um, and there's always going to be some tension with that. And authority, authority kind of reigns supreme in blue. Is that fair to say? 
Yeah, and authority usually congests or like it, it, it starts, it, it, it's attracted to its own. So it doesn't, understand, it doesn't accept pluralism uh, and it doesn't accept critique either because right. it's, and it just sort of beds down with its own, um, you know, sense of authority. But again, it provides order, it provides structure, it's efficient in many instances, and it, it becomes it can become this well-oiled machine. Jamie, talk to, us, talk to us about blue, Jamie. So whereas the previous um, color that was about tribe, you know, it's kind of just the tribe that you were dropped into. This is a tribe of, uh, that we want to claim is of your own choosing. That this is, you've, you've selected this because you agree with the greater good that they're trying to provide. And you've returned back to now working as a group towards that one. And so you have to really lose yourself again because now the greater good that you, and this is their, this is their big hook, right? That you chose this greater good. You're now willing to sacrifice self for this greater good that you chose. Um, and I think that's really kind of where, um, you know, our Mormon upbringing, we say things like, you know, this eight-year-old chose to be baptized and that's why he has to be committed or she has to be committed to this greater good. Um, I think, again, the con is, and the thing that pushes and propels people out of this is the reality that there are factors beyond our circumstances about why we chose this, as far as, you know, culturally and on a much bigger picture. You know, individually, you know, we choose lots of things. We choose the college we're going to attend. We choose the, the sports athletic team we're going to um, root for. You know, there's a lot of things on the individual level. But culturally, I think, you know, the big con is realizing, well, maybe there wasn't quite as much choice in this. I've inherited and there's some, there's definitely some inherent problems at this level, even though the goal may be a worthy goal, you know, e even, but do the ends justify the means? And I think that's where you um, start to question when you're in the blue. Uh, yeah. There are definite costs to some of the greater goals that institutions are working towards. And you start to see the costs. And like you said, the people on the margins, the people um, who may not uh, as easily conform, um, and, and the real question of choice and autonomy. I love it. And Glenn, before we bring you in, I just want to emphasize, I think we can't emphasize enough that one of the central uh, essence, you know, components of blue is that there's a predominant single true narrative that everybody sort of needs to sort of embrace. Instead of it being lots of different truths, something sort of relativ relativistic, there's one plan, there's one set of scripture, there's one interpretation, there's one set of authoritative leadership, and you get on the bus or you get run over by the bus. Uh, Glenn, what would you add? Well, I, I, I think uh, picking up on, on that, you know, Gina mentioned when we were talking about purple, that the, the Bible is a purple text. Um, and, and when she said that, I was kind of like, yes, but it's also a blue text. And, you know, so I, I, I she said the Old Testament, that. she said the Old Testament is a purple text. All right. The Old <laughs> Testament. So, so what makes it purple? Well, what makes it purple is that these were the uh, initial myths that these tribes were telling to themselves to create the group unity, all of this stuff. Um, what happens when it becomes blue? Well, from from purple, you recognize, oh, I'm sacrificing my power, so you go a little bit red. Here's how you can get some power. Here's how you can do it as an individual. You go from red to blue. Here's how we can get power as a group, as a hierarchy, um, while still protecting everybody and doing all those things. And it's it's taking those sacred narratives that developed in that purple stage and codifying them canonizing them, having that be the rules that set up that govern this hierarchy, the, the, the power structures, all of that. So I, I, I think that's the connection between the purple and the, and the blue there. In, in my growing up in the church analogy, <laughs> and I don't mean anything pejorative by this, Lindsay, at all, but I see the... <laughs> preemptive. The that was the preemptive right program, there. The next stage is going on a mission. And the mission is an incredibly blue place. <laughs> It's, you know, when, when <laughs> there's just, just so much um, that we've talked about as blue that's evidence in the mission field, how you really do sacrifice your individuality for the group, white shirts, ties, name tags, you know, what are you doing every single day? And I'm just talking about the guys uh, with the white shirts and the ties. I'm sorry about that. But at any rate, I'm talking about my experience. So uh, I, I see that uh, as being very blue and you know, with, with this group and with this podcast, 
it, it's interesting to listen to the conversation about blue because we're all down on blue. We've all had bad experiences in blue, but actually blue is probably one of the most important V memes for people in the world. Um, and, and, you know, we could have the discussion is religion net negative or net positive that it, that's a blue discussion. Um, what are the benefits that people get in feeling a sense of meaning, feeling a sense of purpose in their life? Why is it that we get so frustrated with TBM family and friends that can't see the things that we see? They can't see the cons of being in a blue V meme because the pros are so strong in their life and they just, that their awareness hasn't creeped over into that cons thing where it actually means something to them like it meant to us. And then we couldn't abide it anymore. We had to do something else. But so that, that that's where I see with blue. And I, I, I don't want to be, be, because I'm aspiring to a, a, a different <laughs> V meme that we'll talk about um, later that sees the value in all of the V memes and, and you know, tries to do that. So I, I think if we're talking about the value of blue, we all experienced it. We all have family and friends who are experiencing it now. And um, that's all I got to say. I'm going to add a comment from Daniel. Daniel writes, in blue, the sacred texts aren't limited to things like Hebrew scripture, New Testament, and Quran. Those texts usually are very closely associated with the charismatic leader of red. Uh, they are sacred texts, but they're not all. I think the LDS, oh, this is really good. I think the LDS Handbook of Instructions, the UN's Declaration of Human Rights, and corporate mission statements, and maybe even the Republican or Democratic platform to take it to a political sort of thing, uh, should be seen on this level. It's basically bureaucratizing. And, um, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not finishing Dana's quote. He says, either way, violation of the text earns the wrath of the hierarchy within the system. I love that, Daniel. I hope you uh, contribute more. I just want to add, um, I forgot what I was about to add. Somebody bail me out while I'm trying to think about what I was going to add. Jamie. I was just going to say something oh, about, oh, sorry, yeah, Jamie. Yeah, Lindsay, then Jamie. Just to tie in a topic we were talking about earlier is I have seen, and I, I don't like to diagnose anyone, but when we're talking about this, I keep thinking of Elder Oaks. I feel like he is such a blue character for me. At least that's what he represents in the yeah. church. I mean, it's very black and white. It's very legalistic. Uh, it's very simple. We have these rules and this is what it is. And if we, if I, I feel like if I were to go to Oaks with a very complicated problem, I would get some blue in return. Like, you know, forget all of these colors. It's, uh, this is the policy. Yeah. And, and almost with the, with the November policy, it was like, wait, what do we have in the rule book? We've got that policy for polygamist kids. Let's just apply that policy to this new thing. It's almost legalistic, and it's almost uh, bureaucratic in nature. Jamie, what did you want to add? And then I remembered. You guys stalled for me long enough to remember what I was going to say. Jamie, what are you going to say? I think as people get frustrated with blue, interesting is that rather than transcending, they just want to create a new blue. And, you know, that's yes. a big frustration to me is that, you know, you look at some of the alternatives out there. I don't want to go to another blue where there's another blue text and another blue leader with another blue thing for me to disagree with so that I can then create another blue thing with another blue leader with another blue text. And so there ends up being so many blues and each one saying they're the right blue. And, you know, for me, I think that's the biggest thing. Like I have a blue in my life. I, I don't need any more. I don't want to <laughs> recreate this. Like I really want to somehow um, yeah. uh, build upon and find something better. I'm not looking for, and you know, we get, uh, Ex-Mormon or post-Mormon circles get criticized for recreating a just a new Mormonism, right? It, it tends to be very male-dominated. It tends to still be patriarchal. It tends to not value other voices. It tends to still be very American. It tends to still, like, we aren't necessarily transcending any of the problems that we see in blue. We're just picking and choosing the things we have and then making it good for us, the individual again. Love it. And, and the Liturgist podcast really did a good job of mentioning uh, New Atheists is an example of blue, which surprised me. But their point was, if somebody leaves their religion, but then their new prophet is Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens or Richard Dawkins, and their new scriptural text is the end of faith or, you know, whatever those books were that came out post 9-11. And, and what they often lack is the ability to truly be self-critical and self-analytical. 
and they look to their leaders and their leaders' texts in very much a blue scriptural one true path way. And science, even science can be um, embraced in a blue way, basically as if science has all truth in it. And if you find some article that says this one thing, then you found the truth. And anybody who disagrees with the authority that backs up uh, the scientific findings, uh, well, they're heretics. No, that's bad science, John. Bad science. Yeah, it's blue. It's blue. It's blue science. It's good basic. science. We're looking for good science. I know. I know. I'm just John, saying. I, I, let's I not think blue is tighter here and say false equivalency. And that, okay. that, that's all. Just just in honor of Randy, false equivalency that is what he would say. But but I, I think if if we go on to orange and talk about what orange is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you recognize that you don't lose your blueness when you expand your awareness into these orange territories, it can help understand why is there still blue even when you're orange. All right, let's do it. So my only point was don't just think of blue as religion. I think I set blue up to be about religion, and it's not. It's about Republican Democrat. It's about corporate America. Uh, it's and, and the point I wanted to make that I'd forgotten previously, and, and I'm going to reference Sapiens and uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn referenced it as well. It's a really important book, but I think that blue represents mankind's ability to scale beyond the small sort of Dunbar's number of the small tribes. It is, it is the blue consciousness that lets humans organize in very, very large numbers. And it, it, I, I think it's what leads me to feel that something like religion or even democracy or capitalism um, is actually a net positive contribution in spite of all its, their externalities because they have they become the foundation upon which, which modern civilization has been built. And unless you hate modern civilization, you sort of have to say for all its defects, democracy, capitalism, and religion have brought us to the dance, have brought us to the ball. Now, Gina, you may hate that I said that, but that's kind of how I feel. I love that you said that. Okay, good. I well, but I do it. want to say something. <laughs> I yeah. want to say something um, in terms of as a biblical scholar. Well, I'm, you know, a theologian. Uh, blue is a kind of all of these, all of these colors or V memes are a hermeneutics. This is a way that we become aware of something, a lens through which we see the world. And so, if you're a blue person and you've got using a blue hermeneutics and trying to exegete the Bible, for instance, you will look for instances of authority and the justification for, for authority or the reproduction of the status quo or for whatever it is. So, I mean, it's just sort of a, a good way of thinking about it. It's a way that we interpret the world, that, you know, the, the kind of lens that we ha have on to interpret the world. Love it. All right, let's jump to the next color, which is orange. And again, blue is more community, communal based. Now we have to go back to the individual again. Orange, think of the enlightenment. Think about Galileo and, and uh, uh, you know, all, Charles Darwin and all those uh, men and women who 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century started questioning the religious and political and economic traditions. Think Karl Marx, these sorts of people that said, we could do better. Uh, we don't like some of these problems. We don't like this corporate stuff. We don't like these bureaucracies. We think that there are some important uh, significant costs with the corporatism, the bureaucracies of what blue brings institutionally. And so orange questions authority, orange questions blue, um, orange sort of seeks to apply things like science to the world, to gather data, to gather evidence, and to establish a worldview based as little on necessarily, quote, authority, in other words, um, you know, the, the, the sort of because some important person said so, it must be true, or because the official institution said it's true, it wants to gather data to say, uh, you know, this evidence says that this might be true. I would say this would be the good science that you're talking about, Jamie. 